Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kilian Groß. I hope you can hear me. Um, I welcome you warmly to this outbreak session on conformity assessment and standards. Um, we, I have a number of distinguished panelists here with whom I want to discuss, but of course, it should as well be an interactive session. So I hope I can attract your attention because we have already heard a lot this afternoon. But um, I think we heard a lot of controversial thoughts and interesting thoughts, and it's very good that we have now the chance to deepen this a little bit. Um, I will quickly give a short introduction into the topic, and then I will leave the room for the speakers to um, uh, for, for a little tour de table, for a little introduction into the topic. And then we will have the time for Slido questions. So you then can post your questions in Slido, and I will try to take up as many questions as possible, because we want to make the session as interactive as possible. So please feel free to use uh, already the Slido if you want to post questions. Uh, the address is AI. Um, uh, alliance hashtag and then you have to go under the button a conformity assessment and standards and there you can you find uh, the possibilities either to participate in the later poll or in uh, to go in to ask questions just from my side a very quick introduction on the topic uh, we want to discuss we heard this in the afternoon panel already a number of times conformity assessment conformity assessment for ai is one option as has been raised in the white paper, um, which the commission released on the 19th of February this year. Um, the ex ante conformity assessment as such is not a new idea. It exists already in product legislation uh, and is used there for many, many years. But one idea, one approach could be to refine this and to use this tool now um, for the assessment of complex AI systems. Just to have a clear understanding for all of us, what does it mean conformity assessment for the different applications of AI? I have here a little graph where I show we have uh, here what we call the old approach, the new approach, and the uh, area of services. Old approach mainly means we have uh, currently sectorial legislation, very important legislation like cars and uh, food, like the type approval, which was already mentioned today, where we have detailed technical uh, requirements in the legislation. So there it would mean if you want to introduce now requirements for AI, you would have to change the sectorial legislation um, in order to make it part of this assessment. On the other hand, you have a new approach products. That is the more recent approach of the commission where we only have essential requirements in the legislation, which are then filled in through harmonized standards. Uh, this is for instance, the case in toys, medical devices and machinery. So here we could much quicker introduce through horizontal legislation um, requirements, which could then be filled up with standards. And then we have a, a quite considerable area of services. So AI systems, which are not embedded in the product, but which just are offered as a service. Uh, here, we do not have the traditional um, uh, product approval legislation. So here, if we wanted to introduce a conformity assessment, we would need to set up a new system, which of course gives us as well room to think, what could we do better? And how could we, if we want to do this, how could we do this in a less burdensome way or in the most effective way? So these would be a little bit the three kind of situations we may want to, to distinguish. This all, all being said, all this ex ante conformity assessment, in case the, we wanted to go that way, would of course only apply to high risk uh, AI systems. And we can certainly have a word on what should be considered as high risk, because uh, I think this is clear after the discussion this afternoon. This is, of course, a very, very controversial issue. If we move to the next slide, um, here I come now to a little bit uh, to the second side of this uh, discussion, because one thing, of course, would be we, would, we could discuss whether the conformity assessment ex ante is an appropriate tool to cover the different risks linked to AI. What we heard already is the, the uh, say, the risks um, related to safety or the risks related to fundamental rights or to the, the social aspect of AI um, and the importance of, of standards in order to, to make this all operational. The other side is, of course, to understand who is doing this and what whom would we need to do this in practice so that it's really applicable. Uh, we would, and here we, we of course, uh, we relate a little bit to what exists as an inspiration uh, in the area where we have already this kind of assessment for products. We have national notifying bodies or accreditation bodies, so the national authorities checking whether somebody is able to do such an assessment. Once certified these conformity assessment bodies, they would then in reality carry out the checks and would can, uh, give the label uh, that the uh, given product or system is uh, in conformity with the requirements. So that would be a little bit the system and this would be national, an, a national structure which may or may not then be co 
coordinated at European level. What I put on the right hand side, of course, all this can be um, complemented by a system of self certification, for instance, where uh, standards exist and where the, the legislation allows that uh, products will um, comply with these standards fulfill uh, the requirements automatically, or this is presumed to fulfill the requirements. I would like to discuss later with my panelists as well whether you think that the system is, is a good system for, um, for AI and whether we have enough skills and capacities in place to do this, to roll this out in case we would adopt such a regulation uh, beginning of next year, Q1 of next year. Um, therefore, without further ado, I would like to turn to my panelists. And before I could ask the uh, perhaps a question, which uh, we put in the Slido poll, uh, just to show a little bit um, uh, what, we, what we want to discuss. Here we have put in the different alternatives, how we could carry out a conformity assessment. And just to, to remind you, we had the same question in the public consultation. And here, 62% of respondents supported a combination of ex ante conformity assessment and ex post market surveillance. Um, and 28% supported external conformity assessment of high risk applications, and 21% uh, supported ex ante self assessment. So please put in your answer. You see the four, four alternatives here. You can read them on your uh, on your phone. And I see. Uh, perhaps we open this now, and we waited to give you a little moment to to see. So if I can read this correctly, because I have the pictures here. Okay, we have 41%. Uh, we have for a compliance should be assessed ex ante with a conformity assessment carried out by a third party conformity assessment. So the uh, the most um, let's say serious or complete system, but it's not com it's still re relatively balanced because we have 30% uh, say that should be carried out with a self assessment, and 24% believe there could be as well another assessment. And if I go down, uh, five percent, and this is moving. Uh, see that there could be only ex post market surveillance. So it's interesting. So uh, you see the opinions are divided, even if we have a, um, a certain preference for the ex ante conformity assessment by a third party. But this perhaps can already uh, give us some indications for our discussion. I have today with me uh, five panelists. Um, so I may briefly introduce them to you. Uh, these are, in particular, I have. Um, here with me, and Dr. Uh, Andreas Steinhorst, who is heading the, he's the executive secretary of the European uh, Cooperation for Accreditation. So he's heading basically the European body, which is coordinating all these different bodies doing the accreditation, which I just showed on the second slide. So he can certainly report on the European level uh, on the need for coordination. I have with me uh, Dr. Henrik Schäbe, who is a senior expert uh, and a principal ass assessor at RAMS and TÜV Rheinland. So somebody who does an organization who carries out these ass uh, assessments so an accredited body in as far as these uh, assessments are already done. I have in addition Mr. Patrick Besons uh, from Sen Senelec, a co-president of the focus group on AI, a true expert. And he's of course as well has very knowledgeable insight about standards and standard setting. As well, I have Katrin Watson with me, the head of the US affairs from Bosch who uh, could give us certainly the company perspective on all this, what would this mean for those who wouldn't have in the end, of course, to pay for these assessments or to undergo the, uh, the assessment or have to carry the, uh, the burden if there's any. And I have last but not least, Ms. Clara Nettle with me, the senior director of the European business operations from IEEE technology, who is as well an expert in technology, but as well in standards, in particular on the international scene. A very warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you. And now I would like basically to focus on your answers because I think I've already spoken enough. So I would start, if you allow, with Dr. Henrik Schäbel. Uh, and I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think is this current state of play concerning the conformity assessments? In particular, if you look at what we discussed this morning, uh, this afternoon on fundamental rights and safety, do you think that a conformity assessment as we know it traditionally uh, can cover both aspects, safety and fundamental rights. Can this be developed in that respect? Or do you think, uh, as Christiane Wendor has said, we should better, better distinguish the two completely? Please, Andreas. So you mean me? Okay, I'm Henrik. Uh, uh, Henrik no problem. Sorry. So sorry. First of all, sorry, Hen first uh, Henrik, all, uh, sorry, I was confused. I, no, I mean, no problem. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for having the possibility to, to sound off here. 
so just when I look about the, the, the situation, so uh, what I'm doing, my work is uh, mostly concerning functional safety. That, that means the safety of systems that might kill or injure people. Uh, and this is a, let me say, a more or less specific task. So in our terms, it would be a high risk application. And if you think about artificial intelligence uh, too. Uh, so if I'm thinking about what we have got here currently, well, that, that's interesting. There, there are different papers existing, also some standards. I think about the UL uh, 46100, which is the first draft standard. We have the white paper, um, but I think, first of all, we need to distinguish, is this application a safety or a non-safety application? Safety in the sense that it might kill or injure uh, persons, uh, cause really large destructions of technical systems or environmental damage, and this has also been pointed out uh, today by Katharina Zweig and Christine Vanderhorst, who already said, okay, there we need to distinguish how to work with these systems. That would be the first distinguishment that we need to do. The second in my eyes is whether this AI system is a pure assistance system. That means there is always a human being that can overrule the decisions of the AI system. And this human being has always full responsibility for all the decisions. And the, the second situation would be that really the AI systems would be a responsible system. That means it makes a decision. It makes a decision, for instance, on a, on a wheel set uh, of, a, of a rail car telling, okay, this is still good enough. And I'm convinced that the axle would not break. So this would be, of course, a responsible decision in, in, in terms of safety. Now, uh, if, if you have these situations that a human is, is responsible, okay, then you are out of the play uh, regarding functional safety. Uh, then in the next step, you can define the safety integrity level for such an AI, AI system. This is quite easy because uh, there exists uh, a, a main standard on, on functional safety, IC 615.08 that is applicable if you do not have other standards on, on functional safety as for, for railways, automobiles or so, but they are all more or less equivalent. So for this standard, AI would be just a piece of software sitting in a piece of hardware and depending on what the system does and what the consequences of a failure would be, you would just get a safety integrity level where you have a long list of requirements that you have to fulfill. And now, if you think about what can you do to prove that this AI system really fulfills these functional safety requirements and you open the standard, the IC 615.08 says regarding artificial intelligence, no. So th then you need to, to find a workaround about this situation. This is, this is well possible. Uh, but what we see here is that there is, a, let me say, a certain precaution and um, there is a certain measure that you will not be able just simply uh, apply such a, such a system. Uh, it, is, it is really possible, need, you need to think about uh, how to attack this and at the end, uh, I think uh, Katharina Zweig showed this already, what we all need to validate. So at the end, we need to run through the entire life cycle of this AI system, uh, verify and validate everything what is inside. We need to check uh, the, the, the model of the algorithms. And at the, at the end, we also need to think about uh, a, a part of the, of the probability of dangerous failures that then needs to be given like a budget to this AI system because there, there we have two kinds of failures. The one is just a statistical failure because this AI system would make statistical decisions. And the second one uh, would be all the, the, the data of the system are at the end based on sampling. And there you also have a second statistical failure. So this is 
you know, mainly my, my picture on if you talk about safety and if you talk about uh, conformity assessment. If you think about fundamental rights, again, we need to look at the context. Which harm could this AI system do? And this defines then very much what we should look for in the insight. Okay, thanks a lot. So you, you would not exclude that we could do both, but you say we have to clearly, clearly identify the context, which is of course an important element. Andreas, I would ask, like to ask you a little bit, because now we heard this, the national perspective from the uh, from representative from an accredited body. What do, what do we need to do at the European level? We heard already uh, Mr. Garcia Del Blanco, what needs to be done to coordinate as well, to have a level playing field and a uniform application in Europe on this? Yeah, first, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, it's a good question, but uh, I can tell you, there's already a well-functioning and reliable system in place, which ensures that uh, regulators and consumers may have confidence in products and services placed on the European market. And this is the European accreditation system based on regulation 765. So uh, please let me explain what, what accreditation means. We have already introduced it uh, to some extent, but accreditation means an attestation by a national accreditation body that a conformity assessment body meets the requirements set by harmonized standards for accreditation and additional requirements, and that is important, additional requirements, including those set out, for instance, in legislations to carry out a specific conformity assessment uh, activity. So the conformity assessment body has to demonstrate its competence, its ability, and in many cases, its uh, impartiality to check, to test products, processes, and services. But for that, we need the robust, the clear requirements set out by, by uh, the regulator. Back to the national accreditation body, that's a what is performing accreditations. Uh, a national accreditation body acts as a public authority and is appointed by the member state uh, to the European Commission as a sole national accreditation body in its country. The national accreditation body is controlled, we say, peer evaluated by EA, the European Association of National Accreditation Bodies. And that is important because uh, Regulation 765 uh, according to this regulation, national authorities shall recognize the equivalence of the services delivered by those accreditation bodies, which has successfully undergone the peer evaluation by EA, and uh, therefore accept the accreditation certificates of those bodies and the attestations issued by the conformity assessment bodies accredited by them. So, and, and, EA itself, it's uh, recognized by the European Commission as a European accreditation infrastructure. And we have signed a framework partnership agreement with the European Commission for the purpose of having a robust and reliable uh, accreditation system in, in, in Europe. And apart from the peer evaluation of the national accreditation body, so they have to demonstrate that they are competent, for instance, to accredit caps for artificial intel intelligence applications, uh, another key activity of VA is to ensure that accreditation is performed in a harmonized way throughout Europe, so that regulators and consumers in Portugal or France or Poland or in any other European country may have the same confidence in certificates. And finally, in the products, products in future with AI applications uh, placed on the, on, uh, um, on the market. Um, so just to, to summarize, if we want want confidence in, in products with artificial intelligence uh, applications, then an appropriate way would, would be that these products are, are verified by conformity assessment bodies based on some criteria that's important, set out by the regulator, and the conformity assessment bodies shall be accredited by its national accreditation body according to Regulation 75. So the, the system is in place, uh, what we need is 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 uh, the appropriate framework on on requirements. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. That's very useful because the whole purpose is, of course, that we create trustworthy AI, and that it's I think what you described as uh, that citizens and consumers can have confidence, and that's exactly what we should look for. Katrin, um, you represent Roche, 
um, that would be certainly a company would would be exposed to these uh, um, extended or new conformity assessments. What would you think about that? How much burden would that be for a company like Bosch, who certainly already has a lot of internal um, standards in place uh, and uh, processes in place? How much additional work would that be or cost? Or would you think that is uh, for some, somebody who is already working on a high quality level, that would not mean uh, so much additional effort? Please, Katrin. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, also thank you from my side for inviting Bosch to participate in this very interesting panel. Um, yes, AI is a topic that is very close to our heart at Bosch. Uh, we also have our own Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence, and we are very happy to contribute to the high-level expert group on the AI from the European Commission. Um, but on the other side, we also have other business units uh, where we already have extensive experience with uh, conformity assessments with our washing machines, dishwashers, and so on. So coming to your question on conformity assessments, we as a company, we have a positive view towards conformity assessments, as long as they are compliant with the new legislative framework and other EU laws and regulations. Um, we have, as I said, we have this experience, for example, to obtain the CE marking. Um, we would see in practice that the higher the risk, of course, that comes with the AI application, the more demanding the criteria that companies like us have to fulfill have to be in order to comply with such an assessment. And then, of course, the more complex the assessment is, the higher the cost would be for us. Um, just to give you, I can't give you concrete figures, but if, uh, the conformity assessment varies from like sometimes one week of work, but it can also go up to one month. But however, if it helps to make the technology safe and reliable, we are ready to support such a process because it can, uh, as you said, it can create the needed trust in this technology. Then of course, as with everything in the detail lies in the devil, um, we generally prefer a horizontal approach to, towards AI uh, to lay down the general principles for AI, for example, in the form of a horizontal law on AI, um, as we fear that a vertical approach would lead to significant legal gaps and uncertainties. And then, of course, there's the question which uh, products or services have the conformity assessment. You said it would be, you mentioned in your introduction that it would be for high risk applications. And there, there's the question what is high risk? But I know this is a very separate question. But in our understanding, uh, it's something that can cause harm to life or health and threatens a large amount of citizens. Um, and just the last point, um, so I said we are in, in favor of these conformity assessments, we just have to make sure that uh, we don't miss out on the opportunities of AI and that there is a good balance between opportunities and risks for AI. But otherwise, we are happy to support this procedure. Thank you. Thanks, Katrin, for this uh, insight and for this very constructive approach. Uh, Katrin mentioned you would support the new approach. Um, Patrick. And the new approach, of course, requires standards because uh, under the new approach, the specific requirements have to be translated into standards. Therefore, my question to you would be, are the standardizations organizations ready to prepare these kind of standards for the use cases for AI? Let's say, for uh, concretely speaking, for instance, for a recruitment tool, could you develop such a standard? Or could you even develop standards for uh, more in a horizontal way so that they can be used for several use cases? Please, Patrick. I think you're muted, Patrick, sorry. Yes, Thanks. Much better like that. Well, first of all, thank you for having invited me um, uh, to address those issues. Uh, I would like to, to get back to the uh, um, state of play uh, concerning standards. Uh, actually, it's a very complicated state of play because you have a, a lot of uh, issues that are being addressed uh, simultaneously. Uh, first of all, you have the technical part that, uh, that start with you know, this uh, specific AI techniques, uh, neural networks and, and deep learning, uh, but then it doesn't stop there. It, it goes much further. It goes into a complex system on, on a, a system of AI systems. I'm just going to give you one example. Uh, let's imagine that a bank as an um, AI system for, for trading. Well, um, uh, you, you, you may think, uh, okay, uh, the bank is going to do all the conformity assessment uh, of this AI system, but its trading system is going to be confronted to, an, uh, to another bank uh, uh, AI trading systems. And then you're going to have two AI systems competing together. And, and, and you don't know how to, to, uh, to make uh, the conformity assessment of that. And maybe we need to have an 
AI supervising the AI systems on, on making sure that things uh, uh, don't, don't, don't get messy. So the, the, the schemes for that is to, 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 to make the conformity assessment of the one AI training system with an AI supervising the training systems. So you see it, it's getting, it's starting to get a, a little bit uh, complicated. Then you have the uh, social technical part, um, uh, which is actually linked to digital transformation of our world. And, with, which leads to topics like ethics, like human agency, like, um, like AI governance, but also uh, to uh, digital sovereignty, uh, because we have to, to uh, address the fact that uh, uh, an AI system uh, could harm uh, our democracy. It has been uh, seen uh, uh, in the past years with, with uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, for example. So yes, this is a kind of, of, of sovereignty, safety issues, but for democra uh, democracy. And then, uh, uh, well, you see, you, you can start crossing all those issues, but then on top of that, um, you have the fact that AI is going to be everywhere. And, uh, and everywhere, meaning that every standardization organization uh, is starting to address AI related standards. So um, uh, you're going to, to have a proliferation of, of standards, maybe duplication, fragmentation, maybe incoherences. Uh, and, and, and then there is this relation between horizontal and, and uh, uh, vertical uh, uh, standardization that uh, um, hasn't been uh, addressed yet. So how can we coordinate uh, between horizontal and, and vertical standardization organization. How are we going to, to coordinate between horizontal uh, standardization organization? We haven't sorted out that yet, and, but there is a clear need for, for a better coordination. Um, then um, uh, I think we may see some, some um, uh, horizontal st standards appearing. appearing uh, I was thinking about um, things like uh, uh, the uh, trust trophy um, assessment list uh, from the AI high level expert group that could be transferred uh, very easily into a, a standard uh, as a guideline, as a good practice. And there are other uh, uh, items that could be uh, easily standardized, but other than that, um, uh, it's going to take some, some time and, and uh, we even have to work on, on um, a new concept of, of conformity assessment. I um, was thinking uh, about the, uh, 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 conformity assessment using simulation, for example. This is something that we, we haven't done really much so far. And this is a new area that we have tremendous implications on and uh, um, uh, notified bodies and, and uh, uh, regulation as well. Thanks a lot, Patrick. This is very, very, very useful. And you are, um, I think you highlighted correctly the difficulty and the complexity of the task, which is uh, given that we, have real, uh, we are discussing a horizontal um, legal act, which could cover a broad range of different applications, is of course cannot be ignored. That's why I would like to deepen that topic uh, with Clara to understand a little bit better um, uh, what we would need to do in order to get the standards in place we would, which we would need uh, to do this kind of assessment, in particular with regard to fundamental rights or as well with regard to safety, with a variety of different uh, systems. So how could we check this comprehensively we, via standards? Clara, I understand you have two or three slides you would like yeah. to present us on this. Thank you. Thank you. I will do this right away. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um... So uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and uh, thank you also for the nice introduction. Uh, so uh, just um, a very short introduction. We are a standard setting organization, but we are, we are also a technical community. So uh, we have um, our members who are involved in te developing technology from research to standardization. Uh, and probably all of you are using now one of our uh, most known standard, the Wi-Fi standard. Uh, 
Um, now, um, we also have a public policy uh, body and I would like just to thank all the volunteers who reviewed the AI white paper uh, and also provided a response to this. Now, coming to the uh, AI white paper, we very much um, welcome uh, the proposal on this ecosystem of trust. And uh, we believe that it should be based on three pillars. Uh, the three pillars should uh, basically address uh, the different uh, life cycles, if you want so. Uh, so first of all, uh, the design and development, uh, then the use and potential impact, and third, uh, the, the, the governance. Um, of course, now uh, Patrick mentioned uh, the um, assessment list and, uh, and other standards. So I think that the whole uh, framework should be based on the principles, of course, which were set up also by the high-level expert group. Uh, and I think that at the moment we have uh, um, we have a consensus that principles like transparency are important. The problem is that we don't have maybe the same language or the same understanding of what transparency is and how to achieve that. I might have a different understanding because I'm a computer scientist and can read a source code than uh, an elderly cust uh, user for a care robot. So I think that standards are important also uh, to create this common language in this ecosystem that we want to build up. And we, see, we saw, just as Patrick mentioned, that now standard setting organizations are, uh, are addressing, be, besides technical standards, also social technical standards. Uh, and we were, um, with our ethically aligned initiative, which is now five years old, uh, we coined, if you want, so this expression from principles to practice and standards being one of the ways to, uh, to do this. But with these adaptive systems, uh, what we also clearly saw is that uh, standards or a good, um, a good design is a necessary but not a sufficient um, condition to guarantee uh, acceptable behavior over the whole life cycle. So one way to do this is to uh, set up some criteria, expected and acceptable, acceptable criteria from the beginning and uh, to um, thus uh, 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 permit conformity assessment through uh, an independent third body or even uh, or through online monitoring, which was mentioned before, maybe in the future. So in IEEE, we uh, set up such an ethics certification uh, criteria so for the moment for three dimensions, transparency, accountability, and algorithmic bias. But I think that last but not least, what you also need to address uh, is the governance because it's the governance basically which uh, decides which standards and certification should be used, which competences should be built up, uh, which are the responsibility lines and so on. And just coming into this two, um, um, the two categories, if you want, so of technical and social technical standards. So um, I'm just giving some examples. So uh, in our P7000 series, there are, um, there are certain standards which uh, address uh, issues such as um, value-based design, transparency, uh, bias, nudging, and so on. Uh, there is also already a standard which is ready, uh, which is on, um, on new metrics of success, which uh, take into account not just system performance, which was discussed before, but also uh, the impact on, on the environment and social. And uh, regarding the framework on uh, governance, there are some, for instance, specifically uh, addressed for age appropriate design for children and so on. Now, of course, you, on the other hand, this goes hand in hand with the technical standards, which address more the safety security aspects that were mentioned before and also interoperability. And some of them go into these uh, sectoral uh, uh, aspects, such as automated driving or um, healthcare or manufacturing. And some of them are horizontal, such as federated machine learning and the related data model and interoperability standards and so on. I, I would just like to um, add one thing which I think is crucial for this, namely that maybe also our ways to um, to develop standards and certifications need to be adaptive and to, uh, we need to be innovative there as well. We have a rapidly changing environment. So we need to work on agile and adaptive ways. So one way we uh, tried out now for our cer uh, certification program is to uh, work with a visual model-based approach. 
uh, which uh, is uh, very quick to adapt to specific use cases and scenarios, as you can see here. So just to give you as an example, in order to develop the criteria, the horizontal criteria for transparency, accountability, and algorithmic bias, we needed uh, almost one year, but then to adapt it to a specific use case, uh, such as contact tracing applications, we needed less than two months. So I think that's important uh, in order to, uh, to, to satisfy the needs of the individual um, a new conformity assessment needs that were, were discussed before. And the other is on this adaptive side. So um, you've seen this, uh, so some of, um, some of the applications should be probably um, not uh, taken care of at all because they don't pose any risk at all. So these are the green. Uh, then we have maybe these high risk applications that should be banned at all. And then in the middle, there is probably this way of uh, conformity assessment. And in our uh, certification program, we do a, an impact assessment at the beginning and adapt the um, effort, if you say so, for the conformity assessment according to the risk uh, profile. So uh, I think that is also a way to adapt. Of course, you have more criteria, the higher the risk is, uh, and, and it is a way forward uh, to uh, adapt it to the specific uh, criteria. So I think just to conclude that uh, this, this ecosystem of trust can be built up, but we need all this. We need uh, probably a standard certification and governance, which includes legislation as well. So thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot, that's a perfect conclusion for the first round that we need a comprehensive system, including uh, legislation, standards, uh, and a governance system. Now I have the difficult task to, uh, that I will probably be unfair because I cannot ask all the questions. So I will try to pick up a few. And I beg your pardon, if your question will not be recognized, I will try to do my best. And I ask my panelists to be so kind to answer quickly so that we can um, give justice to most of our um, uh, distinguished me members of our audience. So perhaps one, um, one quick question to Henrik, I see here in the chat, a very practical question. How can we ensure that we have a sufficient number of uh, notified accredited bodies who can do all this once this regulation will be in place? Is this technically possible? And another question linked to that was, is there not a skills deficit? So uh, would these accredited bodies be able to do this task or do we need to wait until we, we have every, uh, the people and the system in place? Henrik, please. Yeah, so first of all, I think the notified bodies and the accredited bodies need to follow this development. And I think taken alone, the fact that I am here uh, shows clearly that we are doing this. Uh, so we need to do all this in parallel. So the, 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 the bodies, the assessment bodies, the notified bodies need to take part in the development of the, of the standards and in, in, in the directives and they need to, to evolve and develop themselves together uh, with the development of AI and to accompany it. And uh, then we have also the possibility to, to influence a little bit the development uh, because it might go in the wrong direction in several situations. Thanks a lot, that's a, a, a very balanced answer. Um, I would then like to go on perhaps to ask uh, Katrin one question because that came as well here from the audience who should do the assessment because we've seen it was one of the questions in the Slido poll. Should it be a third party assessment or should it be a self assessment which is as well foreseeable under the uh, new approach at the station. Is this for a company a big difference or would you really say um, we, we absolutely need as well the possibility of a self assessment or how would you see that. Um, I would say it really depends on how whatever the I, I application is used for. If it's it's a simple ta usage or there's not high risk mm -hmm. at the moment, we, most of our products we do self assessment. Self assessment doesn't mean that we can just do whatever. I mean there are processes in place to ensure that we are able to do the self assessment, so we have to be accredited to do the self assessment. Um, so for the time being, most of our products we do a self assessment. Um, but for the high risk uh, things, there should be third party assessment. So it really depends on what's the, the purpose of the high, uh, the AI application, I would say. So, but the possibility for self assessment in our op opinion should be, should be there. Yeah, that's, uh, it's certainly a good alternative because it's as well known from the product legislation that will of course be an next post-monitoring uh, in order to check in case or need be whether the standard has been respected. 
I got here another interesting question on standard, perhaps for um, uh, for um, Patrick here. Um, uh, what do, how can standards cover? Uh, so Patrick Besomb, how can uh, standards cover um, evolving AI? Because AI is supposed to be uh, not frozen but may continue. So Patrick, what would you answer to that? Could we develop a standard even and leave some room for further development of an AI system? Uh, well, thanks uh, for that question, because this is one uh, concern that we've been addressing, at least in, um, uh, at the ISO IEC level uh, uh, within the A um, SC42. Um, well, we may have to, to have a, a continuous uh, <coughs> assessment uh, uh, approach. And this is a brand new thing too. So uh, I don't know how, how we, we are going to do that, but this is something that will have to be considered. Now, you, you may have to keep in mind that uh, the, the continuous learning is not going to happen that much. I mean, uh, let's uh, uh, take the example of a self-driving car. The self-driving car wouldn't learn by itself. I mean, the information that the car would get would be sent to a center somewhere with a, a, a standard process, maybe a, a quick process, but a standard process with a, a, a final uh, conformity assessment. So the, the, the future self-driving car is not going to, to learn by itself uh, and ending with the, its own uh, 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 rules. Uh, so that, that's not going to happen. So yes, this is a concern, but uh, we, we're not there yet. On, on, we have some time to mature the approach. Thanks a lot. And then I have a question to, um, I think to Clara, which you triggered a little bit with your uh, pyramid. So uh, what would you then consider concretely as a high risk application? So where would you say in your pyramid um, that is not forbidden, give, perhaps you can give examples of what is not for, forbidden, but what should then really be subject to such an ex under conformity assessment. Perhaps you can give us uh, some insight, Clara. Well, uh, um, I think that what, that is a heated discussion. And uh, as you know, it's going on at the Council of Europe and the OECD and so on. So I can, um, I think that it also needs this discussion at that level uh, and it needs a uh, involvement of, of society because of course one, uh, uh, the, if, it, if it comes to safety, of course, uh, if an AI system is, um, um, you know, it, involved in the control of a power plant and so on. Uh, definitely, that's a high risk application. Um, but uh, I mean, with, when we're talking about high risk application in the concept of human rights, uh, there are also in, um, in the judicial system, uh, very high risk applications, for instance, um, AI uh, that um, pre predicts if somebody is criminal or not. And the question is to what extent this should, um, you know, uh, be left for conformity assessment or uh, really should be treated as through legislation, um, you know, in, in a different way. Um, I think that, uh, you know, especially when it comes to behavior, um, we can see there is a structural element of that and there's a behavioral element. The structural element is really about how you set up the system, what kind of governance structures you have. And this gives you an indication already what kind of ethical uh, you know, ethical and, and safety measures are be take, taken care of. But you still have this dynamic question and, uh, you know, to just talk, uh, adding to what Patrick said, this can be done in the future really continuously. You can think of smart contracts or something like that, which are uh, really um, uh, monitoring the application runtime. Thanks a lot. I knew that I asked you a difficult question, so thanks for <laughs> <laughs> making the effort to find a good yeah. answer and uh, even daring to give good examples. Uh, Andreas, there's one question to you which came here from the chat or from the Slido, uh, is uh, should we not have both ex ante and ex post? Um, or perhaps if you can explain a little bit how, my, how this should be balanced. Should be the focus only on ex ante or should we, we have an equal focus on the ex post monitor and what would you think about that? Yeah, thank you. It's also a good question, but I'm not sure that I'm the, the right person to answer. For, for us, uh, we think it's, it's a combination. It's, it's a, a complementary uh, activity. So we know the system you have already mentioned, 
under the new legislative framework where we have uh, conformity assessment, which is performed before a product is placed on the market. But in the, at the same time, it's also very important that at least for those which products with high risks, that uh, we have market surveillance. So, so both elements are, are, are uh, I think, are, are very crucial, and and uh, they are they are fitting perfectly together. So, so I think both both elements should be considered depending on the on the product and 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 uh, its risk. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, that's very. Very interesting. And then um, I have a bit of a critical question, perhaps here to um, to Patrick. What was this, the standard which took longest? So what it would be, let's say, put it realistically, what would be, uh, if we are on the pessimistic side of things, uh, how long could it take to develop a standard if it's very complicated? What is your experience there? Well, um... Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, um, it depends on the maturity of the, uh, of the topic. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if we, we think about a standard on, on explainability, uh, well, the topic is, is not mature. So it would need uh, R&D, a couple of years of R&D, uh, plus um, the average time to, to set a standard is three years. So, so if we we can agree today that there is a need for explain, uh, explainability for uh, network networks. So uh, you, you probably would have something in five to eight years. So it, it can take a very, very long time. So more than five years, so that's, that's a long time. For standards, definitely, yes. Uh, depending on the maturity of, of, the, of the subject, but uh, we, we are seeing that the, the, the problem, the conformity assessment problem is, is very, very complex. And it has uh, uh, numerous uh, implication on, on the skills for notified bodies, uh, the skills for even for standardization organization, because uh, resources uh, are, are quite scarce and, and if we don't have the proper resources within standardization organizations, we, it's going to take time for us to uh, to, to have those uh, those much needed standards. So, um, yeah, we're not going to see uh, uh, all the needed standards by tomorrow. Definitely. Okay, that's a very honest answer, and I think it's fair because we need to be realistic and we need as well to calculate that the uh, a preparatory time that was as well mentioned as well by Andrea Reinder in the panel that uh, we should as well be a bit realistic what we can do in order to make this operational and and workable uh, from the start. I look here a bit into the chat again. Um, what we have here's a question. Uh, um, I'm thinking um, whom to answer that perhaps to Hendrik. Are we not duplicating obligations because our products are already tested uh, or the products are normally covered, which are high risk. So if we now introduce this AI obligation, could that lead to duplication? What do you think, Henrik? There is some truth in it uh, because when I mentioned the existing functional safety standards and, and, and the mechanisms, so assume I would get a product with an AI application inside on my table, then the first question was, what is the safety integrity level that is required for this product? And this is covered already by the existing standards. I would be able to determine the safety integrity level and depending on this, I would say, okay, there is no safety integrity level. That means no high safety risk. It is out of my scope or otherwise there is a high risk. The question is if someone needs to show that this product has been developed according to safety integrity level one, two, three, four, then, then currently there is a problem uh, to, to prove this. Uh, so, so you see this, uh, the, this question is partially it is, it is correct. Um, there, it would be a duplication. There is already a standard, but on the other hand, the existing standards are not yet complete to be able to carry out the assessment. Okay, thanks, that's uh, very interesting. And then I have perhaps um, 
we, uh, Katrin can help us on this. We have a question here on what shall we do with the, those then who are considered to be low risks, because then there will not be standards. Are they then nevertheless safe? Is it then enough to say, uh, okay, there is no risk, so the companies can basically put on the market what they would like to do? What would you think, Katrin, on this? Um, maybe a little bit what Hendrik said. AI, it's not that AI is not covered yet at all. I mean, if AI is incorporated in the product, it is already covered. At least we feel like we have to make sure that it is already safe and trustworthy. And so I, I wouldn't say then there is nothing. And we don't, as a company, we don't need to worry about it. We always need to make sure that our, our products are safe. We could think about maybe extending some, some of the frameworks or some, so that maybe services are more, um, that they are also covered or software. But we could maybe also think in the existing framework how to, to change there something so that more things from AI are also covered, like, for example, services, software. Because at the moment, the, the, for example, the definition of product is quite uh, focused on hardware, but maybe we could extend it uh, in some existing legislation so that more is covered. And um, perhaps a last question then to, um, we could ask there for perhaps uh, Patrick. Do you think we need specific measures for SMEs in your experience? Or do you think that uh, um, as long as we have standards, SMEs can do this as good as um, uh, bigger companies, like for instance, Bosch, who are more, have more sophisticated uh, processes internally? What do you think, Patrick? Well, um, I, I think that th things are going to be very complicated for, for SMEs. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, uh, we're going to have in the coming years an um, AI management system standard. And that uh, management system standard uh, is going to, to uh, uh, imply a very high, high cost for all companies. And I, I, I don't know how SMEs could handle the price of, of, of the certification uh, with that uh, AI uh, management system. So I, I know that we have to, to address that uh, um, SMEs um, uh, thing. Uh, we have to support them. I, I don't know how we're going to proceed. And, and right now, I'm a little bit concerned because the, 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 the constraints that we put the AI management system on some companies that are not prepared for uh, might, might be a, a burden that they can't uh, uh, support. Thanks a lot. Clara, that's the last question to you. Uh, a very uh, open question. How do you think we could check fundamental rights or what you call your more the social context of AI in such, in such a process? Well, um, the um, social context always has to take into account the impact it has on the, on the users and on the stakeholders. And, uh, just to echo about the feasibility of such an endeavor, I just want to say that um, proof of concepts can also be a way forward. So we are just doing a proof of concept of our certification with one of the major cities in, uh, in Europe, uh, which is working very well. So um, it is about setting up, if you want, so these universal criteria and see how uh, a certification could look like. Uh, and with use, use cases, uh, learning uh, by doing, if you want so, um, and uh, especially in this area of public services for which um, the automation of everything, you don't really have certification bodies until now. Uh, we could see also new, um, new players who would like to do this certification. For instance, cities might be their own they would like to uh, certify their uh, providers, if you want so, and uh, set up their local um, criteria that uh, satisfy a high uh, standard for the citizens. So we see, uh, you know, a part of this uh, um, traditional certification and uh, conformity assessment uh, framework, also new players entering uh, this field and voluntary labeling, which is also about, um, you know, setting up a new value proposition also for SMEs. And by the way, I think SMEs in a public private partnership could also uh, work together with bigger companies uh, because it is in, uh, it is in their uh, interest of the bigger companies to have a trustworthy AI that they will acquire maybe later on. So I think that there are different ways uh, of how this is going to work, which 
um, uh, which which might not be exactly the same as we we, uh, we did until now with uh, traditional conformity assessment. But I'm very hopeful that it's working well. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and I appreciate that you're honest. You try to, to give concrete elements, and we all, I think everybody who thought about it knows it's not, it's not so easy. I would now like, even if there are more questions in the chat, to give all of you the chance to have a last, um, a last statement of, of one minute, because you have to keep the timeline. But perhaps, um, as we, you know, we are in the preparation of a legislation. Perhaps you can give us one wish, which you would commit, like to communicate to the commission. What do you think the commission should take into account when we when we now reflect about drafting future legislation on conformity assessment um, for high risk um, AI applications, is there something you think the Commission should, what should we in any case bear in mind when we do this? Perhaps we can start with Andreas. Yeah, thank you. But please let, let me say something to, to, to Clara. Some of the fundamental rights aspects are already covered by, by conformity assessment. You know that in the GDPR, we, we have conformity assessment included. And, and of course, we need the certification mechanism and, and something, but uh, there's already uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, level. Uh, and, and I guess it can be used also for uh, AI applications. Agreed. So, but, but uh, back to, to, to your issue, I, I think uh, important will be use the existing system. So, so you have already mentioned we have the the new legislative framework uh, with the notified bodies with conformity assessment. Uh, they they have to to be combined anyhow. So so uh, uh, if you have a, a, a robotic, uh, then you have uh, different legislations. Henrik mentioned low voltage directive and others which have to be under conformity assessment. So please use this system also for AI applications. And I, I think then it, it uh, uh, can be implemented very soon. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a very valuable uh, advice. Henrik, what is your suggestion for the commission? I would have two wishes. The first one is let's draw up a very good and flexible standard on artificial intelligence that is written by people who really know what it is. That means select carefully. The, the, the people that are working on this standard. And the second one is uh, when you try to use artificial intelligence, just keep it simple. First, try whether there is a good physical or statistical model that you can use, then you know what you have and you can verify it very easy and use artificial intelligence only if you need the flexibility of artificial intelligence. Thanks a lot. And thanks as well for being concise. That's very uh, appreciated so that everybody can come in. Patrick, your wish. Yeah, I'm um, not sure it's a wish, uh, just a, a thought. Um, we have to keep in mind, uh, all of us, that <coughs> we are at the beginning of a very, very long journey in, in, in setting up regulation and standardization. So we have to be very, we don't, we shouldn't think that uh, it's a matter of, uh, of a one year uh, or two years. So it's, it's going to, to take 10, maybe 20 years to, to, to fully uh, uh, describe uh, what should happen in the, in the digital space. So we, we, we have to be very humble and, and have a step-by-step -step approach. And uh, in the meantime, we, I understand that we, we shouldn't, um, uh, we should pay attention uh, to innovation and, and, uh, and let people and uh, uh, industry pro prosper. So that's, I've, I don't have the, the, the solution, but this is just a thought and that has to be. Uh, no, that's to be taken into account, of course. It's not the, uh, it's not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, it's probably it's just the end of the beginning. Katri, your, your suggestion, please. Yes, we, we have several wishes, but maybe the most important, most, most important ones, as I said at the beginning, we are in favor more of a horizontal approach for AI. And then when defining the term high risk, we would be careful uh, what to include into the term if fundamental rights as such have to be included. We think maybe we could also more think in the categories of how much the humans are in control. If it's human in com control or in command, human in the loop or human on the loop um, to maybe reconsider that uh, principle again. Um, and last but not least, also think that AI offers great opportunities, not only risks. 
but of course we have to take the risk very seriously that um, we want to have a trustworthy AI for sure. These are very wise words, so I have nothing else to conclude afterwards. Clara, your yes. last thought. Uh, um, I, I would just like to echo, um, you know, that, uh, you know, a horizontal approach is important because there are some universal uh, principles um, and uh, such as like uh, really um, focusing on the behavior, uh, you know, expected behaviors that you would like to have uh, from an AI system. Um, and uh, then probably tailoring it to specific needs because that would create also, let's say, an un universal understanding of, uh, you know, these kind of uh, principles such as explainability and so on. I would also urge the uh, Commission to maybe focus on public services first because uh, they have a special um, category, uh, uh, characteristics, namely people cannot choose another service. And uh, I think it's also, um, you know, it's leading by example, uh, so that uh, the Commission can already set up some criteria of what they would uh, would consider acceptable public services and uh, try to enforce those uh, those criteria. So thanks a lot. I will not wrap up now because we will do that in the plenary. But I would not like to leave you without a big thank you because you were all very, very uh, great panelists and you gave a lot of insight. You were short, even if you had much more to say. Uh, but I think we, you allowed a very dense and intense discussion, even as the time was limited. So a big thank you to all of you. And I hope you enjoy the day and I hope we can continue at another occasion. So thanks for today from my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for the good moderation.